So I want to talk about uh, rolling with uh, no slips or something as simple as a, uh, a tire or disc rolling along the, uh, the ground. Unlike my pictures here, we'll uh, try and uh, keep it with a, a constant radius. Uh, you could think of this as a three-dimensional problem, a ball rolling along the uh, ground or a cylinder rolling pin or something like that. So if I go through the uh, pieces here, you could imagine it at, at one point in time that this uh, disc or tire or a ball with a radius R has a contact patch down here. And we're going to say that this, this point here is the point of no slip. Okay, so it's not going to, uh, to slip at that point. And then if this has some angular velocity and some angular acceleration at some point later, it would be right there. And so we'll call this O prime, and this would come down to the, uh, the point here, uh, C prime. And, um, well, I guess I really shouldn't have two C primes on there. So maybe I'll leave the C prime up here and we will uh, get rid of this one. So this would just be the new contact patch there. And if I, if I were to have marked this line on it, as it rotated to the right, that line will be going up like that. And I'll have some new line now from the, uh, the center of this to, to its contact point down there. And that would have swept through an angle of theta. Okay. <laughs> And what I want to try and quantify here, I can talk about the distance between these contact points as s naught. I can talk about the x distance of the contact point as x sub c, because this contact point has not moved that far. It's moved up and it's moved to the right, but it has not moved the, the full distance s naught. And as I said, it also moved up, so we have some y sub c. So I'd like to keep track of that point c. Um, and to do that, I need to keep track of this distance s naught. So I could say that this distance s naught, which is really just this arc length, now if we were to measure this up, it's going to roll through that arc length there if it doesn't slip. So we could say that that would be r times the distance theta. If theta was in radians, r times the angle in radians would give us that arc length s naught. Then if I were to differentiate that, I would get that uh, the derivative of s naught with respect to time is r times theta dot, r of course being constant, constant radius on this thing, which would be equal to r omega. And if I differentiate again, s double dot, which is the acceleration, would be r theta double dot, or r omega dot, or r alpha, the radius, which is again constant, times the angular acceleration. So I'm going to use those, those quantities, particularly this one, to talk about x sub c, how far this contact point moves to the right. So I could say that this was s naught minus r times the sine of theta, where I have this uh, triangle in here. If I look at that triangle, this would be the distance r. This is the angle theta. And I could say that I have r sine theta there. So s naught minus r sine theta, which I could rewrite that as r times theta theta minus sine theta, if I substitute in this expression for s naught. Okay, so I've got x sub c. Now if I take the derivative of this piece, I will get uh, x sub c dot. Taking the derivative of that, that's going to be r, which is a constant, and then theta dot minus theta dot times the cosine of theta, which um, Theta dot is really omega, so if I pull that out, I could say that this was equal to r times omega times the quantity 1 minus cosine theta, pulling that theta dot out as an omega. And um, lastly, if I take the second derivative, or the derivative of the first derivative, x sub c double dot, which is going to be, what, if I use this one here, I'm going to say that I have r times omega dot times 1 minus cosine theta. And then by the chain rule, I need to keep on going, plus r omega sine theta, theta dot. Okay, so the product rule or the chain rule in that place. And if I tidy this up, omega dot, that's actually equal to alpha. So I have r times alpha times 1 minus cosine theta plus r theta dot is omega, so I'll have omega squared times sine theta. 
Okay, so there's the position, the velocity, and the acceleration in the x direction for c. And I could go through this uh, also for the uh, the y. If I talk about y sub c, we know that this po contact point increases in, in height. It goes from the bottom, and it's now up some distance, y sub c. So if I talk about this y sub c, I could say that that was r minus r cosine theta, where the side of this triangle would be r cosine theta. So with that, when I take the derivative of that, y sub c dot, what am I going to have? R, let's see, R sine theta, theta dot, which, uh, let's see, the theta dot's omega, so I have R omega sine theta. Did I do that right? Yeah. Okay. And if I take the second derivative, I should be taking the derivative of that, I'm going to get um, r alpha sine theta plus r omega cosine theta, theta dot, which theta dot's omega. So I could say this is really equal to r alpha sine theta plus r omega squared, because the theta dot's omega cosine theta. Okay. Um, so hopefully you don't think you've walked into the wrong class. This turned into a math class. Um, I'm going to have to do this again for the top of the wheel, and then I think we can make some some um, extensions of this. But before I go and look at the top of the wheel, I want to let theta equal zero degrees and see what we come up with. So what would uh, x sub c be if this one here, if theta is equal to zero degrees, that should be zero, shouldn't it? And x sub c dot, if theta is equal to zero degrees, looking at that one, that would be zero. And x sub c double dot, remember we're talking about the velocity with the first derivative and the acceleration with the second derivative, this turns out to be zero, so not much of interest there. If I then look at uh, y sub c, that's zero, and the velocity in the y direction that's going to be zero. And before I say that this is zero, I probably need to be careful. The acceleration is actually equal to r omega squared. Or r omega squared, you start to think, ah, that sounds like normal acceleration, doesn't it? So we'll see that again. So I'm going to have to uh, come back uh, to this. Questions so far? Yes? Y double prime. Ah, that's because I should have put the subscript here and the S double prime right there. That was just carelessness. So thank you. Other questions? So like I mentioned, I'm going to go to the uh, top of that wheel or disc or frisbee, whatever you think's rolling along, and go through this process again. Probably not quite in quite as much detail because you can reproduce the math on your own. But again, if I have this disc here and I'm now interested in this point D at the top. It's still rolling with no slip, so we have no slip here. There's no back spin. There's no slip at that point. You could imagine that this is, as it rolls to the right, this uh, position D is going to drop down to some new position. Okay, so I want to keep track of how far D travels, the X of D, and how far D drops down, the Y sub D. So let me uh, go through that. Again, the uh, distance of the centers would be S0, which is equal to R times theta. So if I want to talk about the X position of D, I could say that that was uh, S0 plus R sine theta, which would be equal to R times uh, theta plus sine theta. And then if I did the first derivative of that, I get uh, r omega times 1 plus cosine theta. And the second derivative is going to be um, r alpha times 1 plus cosine theta minus r omega squared sine theta. Make sure I got that right. Yeah. And then if I do this for the uh, y, so y sub d, that's going to be what? 
uh, it's going to drop down, so it's going to be minus r minus r cosine theta, which really is minus r plus r cosine theta. So if I take the derivative of that, the first derivative is minus r omega sine theta, and the second derivative is equal to minus r alpha sine theta minus r omega squared cosine theta, if I got that right. Okay, so let me look at this also when theta is equal to zero degrees. So I come up then for x sub d, that is, um, what does x sub d turn out to be? Should be zero, doesn't it? And uh, y sub d turns out to be equal to a value for that. Uh, that should be zero also, shouldn't it? Okay, so then um, the ones that I really want are x sub d dot, the velocity. Remember, this is the velocity. And then the acceleration. So x sub d dot is turns out to be 2 times r times omega. x sub d double dot would then be equal to 2 r times alpha. And if I look at y sub d dot, that turns out to be equal to 0. And y sub d double dot is equal to minus r omega squared. And looks like normal acceleration. So what I want to do is I want to take this and what we uh, got when we were looking at the bottom. So this is at the bottom. This is at the top. And I mean, we could keep doing this. We could turn this into a really ugly math class and just keep doing this, look at the center and whatnot. But I think by doing the bottom and the top, uh, we can probably make the extension to the whole thing. And if I go through this, if I look at the velocity, so looking at our first page, this is the velocity, right? I don't have any non-zero velocities there. If I look then at the top, what do I have for velocity? In the x direction, I've got 2r omega, don't I? So I put that here, 2r omega, like that. I noted that the bottom was zero, so I guess that wasn't to say that it's nothing. It's zero, um, but that's an important value. So zero there, 2r omega there. And if I did the center, and you might want to go through this process for the center, if I did the center, this would turn out, and you could see it's a linear relationship, as r omega. Okay. So that's the velocity. And then if I look at the acceleration, so I look at the acceleration at the top. So there's the acceleration at the top. And here is the acceleration at the bottom. So I get the acceleration that looks something like this. In the x direction, it is 0 at the bottom. In the x direction, it is 2r alpha at the top. If I looked at the center, or by using a linear relationship here, I would be able to say that this is r alpha at the center. And then if I look at the acceleration in the y direction, the acceleration in the y direction at the top was negative, so it pointed down, and the acceleration in the y direction at the bottom was positive, and it was r omega squared. That was that normal term that we had there which uh, that hopefully makes sense when we think about something rolling along with like that, that we would have that, uh, that acceleration. Now, the velocity is probably easier to visualize. You could really think about this almost as a, a stick or lever pivoting around a point, and we'll call this pivot point the point of no slip. And if this has some omega, angular velocity, we would expect that point to be going faster than that point, wouldn't we? Okay. This goes back to the uh, example we did the first day of class that we talked about, where you have a uh, vehicle. OK. 
Okay, and if it's uh, traveling along like that with some velocity v, we would expect the uh, center of the wheel to have that same velocity. It's hooked to the rim, it's hooked to the axle, hooked to the spring, hooked to the car. Should have that same velocity v, shouldn't it? And the bottom should have zero velocity, and then the top would be what? Oh, by this linear relationship, we would expect that to be two times the velocity. Okay, two times the velocity. So the acceleration is kind of hard to see, but the velocity one is is fairly easy to to recognize. Now, pretty soon, we're probably not going to call this the, the point of no slip, but we're going to call this the instantaneous center of zero velocity. So we'll talk about that as our IC. Okay, instantaneous center of zero velocity. Questions with that so far? So hopefully it was worth uh, uh, turning this into a, a bad segment in a math class to come up mathematically with what's going on here because oftentimes students are really uneasy about this that the top of the tire is moving twice as fast to the right as the center of the tire okay. and if you think about this momentarily that tire is stopping and it's actually pivoting and then it's going to another pivot point and pivoting again this is why if you looked at a tracked vehicle and this was your assignment at the beginning of the term wasn't it didn't I say you needed to find a tracked vehicle and you would find that the velocity of the vehicle, and if you look at the velocity of the track, the top of the track was moving quite a bit faster, in fact, twice as fast as that of the vehicle. So uh, if you haven't done that yet, dial up YouTube or something and uh, watch that. I'll try and bring in a demonstration of that in the days to come, too. Questions? Well, this allows us then to, to tackle some problems with a different perspective that we may have done in the past. Let's say we look at a very easy problem here. We have some sort of a uh, pulley like this. It's pulling up maybe some sort of a, a load. And we wonder what the velocity of the load is. Okay. Well, we could model this as a no-slip problem. If I look at this pulley, I could say I essentially have no-slip at this point. And if I look at this being the velocity v, what do I know that the velocity here at the center is? It has to be v divided by 2, doesn't it? So we could say that the velocity of the load is whatever velocity we have there divided by 2. So we've tackled problems like that in the past. We talked about the length of the rope and took the derivatives of that, or the rope or the cable, and went through that. But you can also look at this with a uh, no-slip. You can apply this as many times over as you want. You can have a, a fairly complicated problem. Let's see. So... Here. I'm going the wrong way on that, aren't I? There we go. And then over here, I need to. Yeah, so we would just do it uh, three times over for that one, right? So just, just a little bit different way of looking at that. Questions of that? A fairly simple problem. Let me try a uh, quite a bit more difficult problem, a, a good practical problem. Everyone likes a car problem. So we got some sort of a car there. I'm not sure what kind of car that is. Got a T-top there. Um, and we're told the uh, car is going, what, 80 feet per second, so it's just shy of 60 miles an hour. Remember, 60 miles an hour is 88 feet per second. It's on a uh, wet road, and we're told due to slipping, the rear wheels have an omega of 100 radians per second. So if there wasn't uh, slipping on the wheels, it's probably something less than that. We'll uh, analyze that more completely in a moment. If what we'd like to find is the speeds at points A, which is the bottom of the tire, at points B, the uh, uh, 
trailing end, the back end of the tire, and at point C, the top of the tire. And we're told that it has a uh, 1.4 foot radius. Um, certainly with a radial tire, the uh, radius at the bottom would be slightly different than the radius at the top, but we're going to take it as a constant value, keep this pretty easy. The biggest thing you can do in a problem like this when you're dealing with either an instantaneous center or we'll start out talking about this having a point of no slip is to draw a diagram. So let's look at that uh, wheel. It's not a great wheel, but uh, anyway. So we're told the uh, car is going at 80 feet per second, right? So let me put that here. 80 feet per second. And the uh, presumably the uh, the wheel is slipping. It has some omega here that's equal to a hundred radians per second. And if it's slipping, the bottom of the wheel is not stationary anymore. It's actually has some velocity like that, doesn't it? Okay, and we could talk about that as the velocity of a. So then, if I look at this relationship. I could talk about this velocity here, which is the velocity of C. Okay. And in fact, if, if this holds up and I've drawn it to any reasonable scale, this point here will be our point of no slip. And that seems kind of weird, having the point of no slip, not where it contacts the road. But if it's slipping with respect to the road, that's actually true. We're going to call it something better in the future. Again, instantaneous center of zero velocity. Because we, for all practical purposes, you could really think about this thing pivoting about that point, couldn't you? Yeah. You can think about that pivoting about that point. So let's see if I put some geometry on here. We know that this uh, radius here is uh, 1.4 feet. Let me call this uh, distance here x. That's an unknown. So um, then this distance that remains here would be what? r minus x. Okay. So I could say then that... Um, Let's see. I know that omega times r is equal to the velocity. Is that right? So I could say that I have 100 radians per second times the distance. This is a general equation, right? A hundred radians per second times this uh, distance is equal to the velocity. What's the velocity? We know that at the center it's 80 feet per second, right? So my distance turns out to be 80 divided by 100, which gives me, of course, 0 0.8 feet. Okay. Well, 0 0.8 feet, that's that's r minus x, isn't it? So, <coughs> r minus x is equal to 0 0.8. We know that the radius is then 1.4. So, x turns out to be equal to 0 0.6 feet. Okay. So that's the x distance. Well, that becomes fairly important because if I want to find the velocity of a, I could go up and rearrange this general equation. We could write another general equation here where uh, the velocity divided by the radius or distance is equal to omega, right? Did I do that right? Yeah. Okay. Is that the one I want? Yeah, I guess I wanted this one. This one's good. I'm going to go back to that one. So I'd like to find the velocity of A. I could say that the velocity of A is going to be equal to what? This x distance times omega. So what's x? 0 
what's omega? A hundred? So I get uh, 60 feet per second. So there's the velocity of A. Do I have the velocity of C? Yeah, the velocity of C is pretty easy. That's the, some distance. What distance is that going to be? Yeah, 1.4 plus R minus X times 100, right? What does this whole thing turn out to be? R minus X is 0.8. So 1.4 plus 0.8. 2.2, 220 feet per second. So there's the velocity at C. And maybe I'll finish up here. Have another page. And I'd like to uh, try and draw this uh, wheel a little more carefully. And we say that uh, there's the velocity of A. And we've got the velocity. We knew that was 80 from the beginning. Let's see if I get this. That's not bad. There's the velocity of C, which is a lot larger. We could see that that's larger. That makes sense. There's the velocity of A. That's smaller. That makes sense. And how about B? Where's B? Well, B is hanging out over here, isn't it? Well, I know that this point is my point of no slip. So how do I get the velocity of B? Well, if I take and I put a perpendicular to that, and I know that that is the velocity of B. I mean, this is effectively pivoting about this point, isn't it? So that's the velocity of B. So I guess I need to find, I could say that this was R sub B. So I could talk about R sub B. That's going to be equal to, do I have a triangle in here? I hope so. It's going to be something like this, right? Where this distance is R minus X, which we said was 0.8. And this distance here is just r. So I could say that that's the square root of 1.4 squared plus 0.8 squared, which gets me 1.6 feet. So rb is 1.6 feet. Can I get the velocity then? Yeah, the velocity is equal to some distance times omega, right? What's our distance? 1.6 feet. And omega, that's the same everywhere. That's still 100. So I get a 160 feet per second. And it's in this direction. It's perpendicular at that, at that point. You could go back through the geometry and find the angles there if you wanted to. It didn't ask for the vector. It just asked for the magnitude. So I'll go ahead and leave it like that. So that makes it quite a bit easier. If you can draw perpendiculars, you can come up with velocities. Questions with that? Yes? Uh, if I were to report them without the diagram, I'd want to, yeah, definitely have opposite sides. Yeah. That's a good question, that the, uh, the velocity of A and the velocity of C are two different directions. I'm pretty comfortable with the way I've represented them here because I've got this diagram to accompany them. But if I didn't have that diagram, I'd need to be much more careful. Yeah. I think technically we're hanging a lot on that we were supposed to report the speeds. So we've just got the magnitude. Other questions? Yes? No, the, uh, the radius here is, our pivot point is moved up because of the, uh, the tire is spinning. 
because it does have some velocity. That I've taken the tire as round throughout the entire process. Other questions? Well, let's take a look at an example of a tire that isn't spinning. So, this is kind of a, a, a tragic example here, but if I, I, if I look at it's not spinning, we know the velocity there is uh, zero. V is equal to zero. This is our point of no slip. Okay. Um, and let's say that the vehicle is moving along with some velocity V. Okay, so we could... Uh, We've learned our lessons well. We know that this is two times the velocity. Okay. And uh, what happened, uh, th this example, the uh, engineer at uh, ODOT, one of the engineers at their, their truck shop, called me up, and uh, he was trying to analyze a situ situation that they had. They had a, a truck, and it got a, uh, a, a rock caught between its dual wheels. If you look at the uh, uh, view from this direction with uh, dual wheels, like they have on the back of a, a lot of trucks and tr heavy trailers and whatnot, you have these uh, dual tires here. And there's a, a space between them, and you can uh, sometimes get uh, a debris or a rock wedged in there. Okay? And that is a situation that was over at the uh, coast where they got this uh, rock in here, and uh, it came out and uh, actually went through a, a pickup cab and killed someone. Okay, And it was on the oncoming traffic. Okay, And he wanted to talk about that people were trying to tell him that, uh, yeah, it spit it out the back of the tire. And uh, he didn't think that was true. And I agreed. I didn't think it was true either because if you look at this diagram, we are really pivoting about this point here, right? I mean, we, we got a sports car here on a wet road you got slip at the bottom of the tire. We're talking about a gravel truck uh, on dry road. Probably not, probably not peeling out, right? Okay. So then if we look at this as the point of no slip, and I take this up here, where's the velocity going? Velocity is going like that, isn't it? I didn't even do that justice. That's a right angle. Okay. So a lot of people were trying to uh, tell him that, no, the, the vehicle threw it out the back. And uh, I agreed with him that it didn't throw it out of the back. I think it was a belly dump, uh, some sort of a belly dump truck. It had a profile kind of like that. And I said, I thought it went up and hit there, went out, and was suspended, and then the other car drove into it. Okay, Because they've had very similar situations with people throwing, uh, nasty people throwing stuff like this off of overpasses, right? Okay, So that this was then suspended right there. So it's kind of an interesting problem. And once you look at a, a, a problem with, with no slip or the uh, instantaneous center of zero velocity, it becomes obvious what happened here. The motion of that is not towards the back. The motion is usually going to be more up. Um, but then it comes out, and then the uh, oncoming vehicle uh, gets hit by that. Okay. So that's always kind of uh, interesting. The uh, question then comes up is, how do you fix something like this? So what are some options to fix this? Uh, mud flaps might, might be required. I'm certain this was, a, I mean, this is an ODOT rig, so it's probably in good repair. Uh, so the, I think it probably went up above the mud flap. Yeah. But yeah, mud flaps help. Mud flaps probably help a lot with rocks that are down here that don't get lodged, and if you lose traction momentarily on those, then those will come shooting out pretty fast. Yeah. What are other ways of, of improving this situation? Yeah. You might have some, some skirts, some fringe over there. That's usually more for the, uh, the water. That helps with the water. You could have, and, and actually ODOT at the time had a policy where the drivers had to, when they were leaving the construction site, they had to check and make sure that this didn't happen. But you got to remember, uh, you have a lot of trucks leave the site. It may be going 24 hours a day, so they're trying to figure this out at night. Okay, so you can have human error and a problem. 
Uh, I was good sized. Okay. Because if the rock is is fist size, it won't even get stuck there. So it's going to have to be a uh, you know a croquet ball size or bigger. Pretty good sized. So what are some other ways we avoid this? Um, you can have some more exotic fenders and whatnot. One thing that I suggested to them is you stop running duels and start running what you call uh, super singles. Okay, and you've probably seen them. A lot of times trucks that haul uh, petroleum products will have this because if you have duels, you have to stop every hour and check to make sure that you don't have one that's gone down because then it'll catch on fire, which hauling gasoline with a tire that's on fire is probably not a good option. Um, and he actually said that uh, he had done a study and that if they went with super singles and went with alloy uh, rims, so they lightened the rims, you, you got a lighter wheel and tire package, you could actually save enough money to justify it. Um, but it was uh, politically not advisable to have all of the state's trucks running around with uh, alloy rims. So uh, people don't want to, to think that the, the, the state has that much money. So, so the super singles uh, is a real solution, but probably wasn't going to work from a political standpoint. Another option they do sometimes on uh, off-highway trucks is they'll have some sort of a knife blade that hangs down into here. Okay. Um, which knocks then that out as that comes around. And that's a bit more of a problem on a highway truck where you're going to have more flexibility in the suspension and things like that. So, so I, I point this out as an interesting problem, unfortunately a tragic problem, but an interesting problem that you can explain and analyze very easily if you understand the concepts of no slip and instantaneous center. And then go about the most important part is trying to correct this, trying to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, we can take a lot of, of uh, pride in this analysis, but at the end of the day, what we want it to what we want to do is not have it happen again. Questions with that? Well, where we'll go next time when we get together is we're going to try and demystify something that people make way harder than it is, and that's a planetary arrangement. So I guess I got that backwards. The uh, if I look at a uh, what we will say is a sun gear, and then I'll put some planet gears, and theoretically you could just have one planet gear. That would cause a lot of side loading. Oh, that's not much of a diagram there. Okay. Well, we're just going to talk about this, so I don't have to do much about this. But what you have is the uh, the planet gears. You have this ring gear, okay, and you have the sun gear. If you ever drove a car with a uh, planet or an automatic transmission, they almost always use planet gears in them. If you use a pencil sharpener, it has planet gears in them. And if you think about this, if we fix the ring, because we're always going to input on one, we're going to have input on one, we're going to have output on the other, and we're going to fix the third. And if we, for instance, fix the ring here, what's the motion of this planetary gear look like if we fix the ring? It looks like no slip that we've been talking about, right? So we're going to take this uh, situation that a lot of people make way more complicated than it is, and with no slip, analyze it and uh, come to some, some conclusions. So that's what we'll do next time. Take care till then.